Here are a couple of tips and tricks for using Adobe Speedgrade CS6. Let's start with some of the things that you can do in the desktop. So, for one thing, if I have to really just go through a lot of material and really just see it, you might actually really just really scroll down here, but I just like to get an overview. And there are a couple of ways to get you there. So the one thing you could obviously do is just really scroll down here and come down with the thumbnail size. But I actually want to see a bit more of that. And then at the same time right now, as I'm not conforming, I don't need any of the tools down here. So you can really just push tap or alternatively P, whichever you prefer. And you can really just close out of everything that's not the desktop, but still see the timeline so you can start adding material here. And then you can even go further up in the thumbnail size. The other thing that I really like is that I don't want to actually see anything but footage right now as I'm really just starting to build grades for material that hasn't even been sent to editorial yet. So what I can do here in the pull down for selecting specific files for being viewed on the desktop, I for example can just say, uh, give me everything in raw files. You'll see that everything else that was in the folders that I'm looking at is now just really gone and not in my way anymore. And then it comes down to just seeing ARRI and R3D files. Now, as a matter of fact, if you already know that you only want to see the RAD files here, you can use the same methodology really just to say, show me the RAD files. Or eventually, you can also just use the wildcards if you prefer. And then this is going to give me the Alexa raw files that I have on my desktop here. And just really come back here and put in an asterisk to go back or select all view, whichever preference you have. So let me show you another thing that's quite handy, which is working with multiple resolutions alongside one timeline. So I'm going to use here a shot from an Arri Alexa, which is a 3K, and this is a 4K from a Red Epic. And on the timeline, this is what's going to happen. If I go from the first shot, which is the 3K, to the second shot from the Red, you're going to see that actually the image is now breathing. It's going up and down in size. And that's not necessarily nice to look at. For grading, it's just in the way because I'm not interested in the differences in resolution at this point in time. So here's what I can do. I'll bring back all the tools here just by clicking P. And there's something here in the Timeline tab. If you go to the View section, you've got the Screen Layout tool here. And you can do a number of cool things with it, but the thing that is really best here is that I can keep width alongside everything in the timeline. And it's really not just limited to two shots. So whatever is on the timeline, we're actually going to up -res to the maximum resolution. So the highest resolution shot is becoming the standard for everything else. So you don't need to worry about still seeing pristine quality. That's all cool. But you don't really need to then just zoom in, zoom out for each shot. And again, this can go just really across the board for resolution. So you can mix SD, HD, what have you. Not saying it's reasonable, but sometimes you have to, and it's cool that you can just really quickly mix that. This is also reflected in the output engine. So let's take a look at the render output, which is another quick tip for you. Um, you've got the opportunity on output to say you want everything to look as 1080p. And then it actually doesn't matter what's your source resolution. If in this pull-down you choose a specific resolution, speaker is actually going to scale all your material to that specific output resolution. So you can make it work just for preview. And it's a real-time scaling process for preview. And it's a really high-quality process on output on either up or down scaling. We're even identifying which algorithm to use for either one of them, as there are obviously advantages going either direction. And speaker is going to make an intelligent call to really produce great quality for you. So let's have a look at another thing that I find to be quite handy. And in this case, let's close out of the desktop, bring up all our tools. And you know, sometimes I just wonder what kind of quality I'm getting here. If it's a raw file, that's never quite doubtful. But let's look at something that's been transcoded already. So I've got some of the same shots here transcoded to QuickTime in that folder over here. And ideally, let's just quickly find pretty much the one we already had on the timeline, which I believe should be this one here. So for one thing, that's already downscaled to HD. Uh, that certainly isn't big of a deal. But let's see something to the technical quality of the picture. Sometimes you're actually asked to do things with a picture that you just can't do because the quality isn't there in terms of what kind of bit depth is there, what kind of granularity, or even artifacts in the compression. So the scopes actually look quite all right. 
rather similar to what we've seen before. So this is certainly a good transcoding in the first place. It's not killing bit depth. But here's an interesting tool for you. If you go yet again into the view section of the application and just look for the channel view, it's got lots of options for various purposes. And people who are coming more from the compositing world will actually be familiar with most of them and what to do with them. I'd just like to point out one particular view here, which is the HSV composite. And this is really interesting. And really, let me just take this to a full screen preview. You can actually now see, yep, we pre preserve the bit depth, but there are some compression artifacts in this picture. In particular, if I just let this play on the moving picture, and I'm not saying good or bad, it's just I want to be able to qualify before I even go into the grading if this is actually a good transcoding of the material. If I'm working with something that is transcoded for whatever reason, for example, because it's an effects shot. So I want to get the best quality in here and see what I'm able to do with it. Doing secondary keying on this kind of material, for example, is already sort of problematic. And you just might want to ask for something higher quality then. So let's take a look at another amazing tool that's going to help you for shot matching. So I'm going to get out of cinematic mode here and really just, well, you know what? Just get all these shots in as this is fantastic material. And what I'll do to really just make this work quickly as I'm interested in one particular tool and not creating a final look for it, I'm going to show you another way of just really quickly getting to something nicely looking. I'm going to pull in a lookup table really just overall for the timeline here in my calibration pull down immediately getting me to a more cinematic look. Now, color actually, at least for a lot of people that's true, color can be in the way if you just want to make sure that the light in all the scenes are controlled in really a similar fashion and you get to a result rather quickly. So I typically actually might want to start with balancing the shots a little bit. I'm going to get there just quickly to, so you get my general idea of what can help you with balancing the shots just for light in the scene. You've got all the options here to see RGB, and if there's an alpha present, you can also make that visible on screen. And that's also already helpful for seeing some of the imbalance here between the channels. But um, if you just click on Luma on the L here, then it's actually really super easy to see which scene actually needs you bring up the gamma or tone it down a bit. So again, I would probably actually balance them a little first, but then if you go to this pass, basically watching the material black and white, it's a hell lot easier to start doing shot matching for that particular purpose, really just controlling light in the scene. As you're not distracted by color, by saturation, whatever else there is. And it also will actually allow for you to see once the light is controlled in the scene, if you come back then with full color view, if for the most part what's actually different is saturation, you're just getting more focused on really fixing that task rather than uh, getting distracted by all the various things that are sort of mixing and blending. So yet another tool for helping you just look at your material in a different way to get you to identify what you need to be working with. Then something else is actually important to know. Uh, you've got this pull down here for um, what kind of magnification you want to use. Um, I typically actually love on a single screen layout to really just quickly on uh, click on here zoom to fit which I had done already but you also got hotkeys and so I've got control shift home to give me pixel by pixel and control home to fit to whatever is available to me on the particular screen size I've chosen to work with and that's also cool if I go into this mode so if I use shift H to really get a full screen preview on this kind of screen I can really just easily do the same thing I either fit or then go for pixel accurate at full screen preview, I typically prefer that. So these are just a couple of tips and tricks for using Adobe Speakwit CS6. There's a lot more to discover, and we hope you're going to enjoy that.